All right, hopefully you guys can see the meetings and trainings page. Good morning, everybody. Today we're gonna review the releases for all the applications starting with USAS and the, uh, like a recap of all the releases for May. So if you wanna follow along under the meetings and trainings page, later this will be recorded under this link and today's date. But at the bottom, if you want to follow along, the link for May is here. So USAS had two releases, one hot fix and one regular. The, hold on just a moment. There we go. Um, the hot fix included correcting an issue with a few districts who received a severe error when they were posting their accounts receivable payments. So that only affected a few districts, but that's been fixed. And then the regular release included an improvement to the vendor import to load the ACH fields into the vendor, or when they're doing the import, it'll populate those fields on the vendor. So I'll show you what I mean. So the fields that are gonna be populated when you do a vendor import can be these. So the ACH active, the bank account, routing number, deposit type, and entry class code. So I actually have a spreadsheet. This has been formatted to match the requirements in the documentation for all the other fields, but these are the fields that I am going to um, fill in. So, oops. This button on the vendor grid, import, I'll choose that file. And it'll give me, once I hit load, it'll give me whether it populated or if there was an error. So I forgot to point out the name, but it was um, Pastries by Patty. And I must have did this in another, in prep preparation of this training. So I have two vendors, but they both populated because they both had different information. So just pretend it wasn't the same name. But if you look at the more recent one that we just added, you can see it's the information that I had on the spreadsheet that did populate. And then, oh, when you're doing that import too, if you do it multiple times like I did, oops, if these were the same, it would just like update the information and before it was populating another email address. So if you imported the same vendor three times, it would keep adding a um, email. So that's been corrected as well as when you import, let me, down in the locations, the um, the line two of the address will no longer populate with the name two. This was populating over here, and that's been correct, corrected. Any questions on that? Now, other than that, the only other thing was some USAS internal improvements. Matt, sorry, can can I ask a quick question? What did you mean about the email was duplicating? Was it a putting another new email when you said that's been corrected? It was doing something with the email. Yeah, it was adding um, email address one, email address two, email address oh, three, but it okay. was the same. Okay, thank you. Yep, any other questions? Okay, so I will hand this over to Lori for USPS for the main 
recaps. All right. Looks like that's something clear there. Share my screen. <clears throat> Okay, is everybody seeing the release recap? Yes. Okay, perfect. So make sure we're on the same page. <clears throat> okay, so we'll switch gears here and talk about the payroll side of things. Uh, <clears throat> in the month of May, we did have three um, regular releases. So we'll cover everything that was included in those uh, three releases. Um, the first being some bug fixes and that um, the first item was to correct um, some missing information from our REST API. Um, in particular, the employee ID filter was missing on the compensation REST API. And anytime we're talking about, you know, REST APIs, that is the new um, SOAP service for um, our new ESS employee self-service um, application. So when we refer, refer to REST API, that just means it's the connection that um, the employee self-service is now using. <clears throat> so kind of behind the scenes, nothing that probably um, you know, you're gonna see on the application itself. But the next bug fix um, dealt with correcting some Medicare tax calculations. So um, hopefully all of you were aware on the 2024.7 um, release, we actually changed the way that Medicare pickup um, over $200,000 is being calculated. Um, we had received some guidance that those uh, calculations should actually be using the inflated um, Medicare amount. So prior to that, it was not. So it will now, you know, if you go back to the release notes on 2024.7, um, <clears throat> we talked through how the system, you know, those changes and how that was taking place. I think it was back in April, if I remember right. Um, we did realize that we were not including the pickup amount um, for the actual um, payroll that was taking place. Um, so if if you were if a district was processing um, a payroll and they actually you know were hitting that two hundred thousand dollar threshold, um, the inflated amount for that current payroll was not being considered. Um, to know whether or not that threshold was exceeded. So that has been corrected. So it will now use the inflated amount for that current payroll um, the district is processing um, to do its calculations. So probably nobody um, hopefully was affected um, by, you know, got caught prior to this bug um, fix being released. Um, hopefully nobody was you know, unless they're paying severance or something, it's kind of early in the year for those changes to, um, you know, take place. Towards the end of the year, yes. So anyway, um, it's now been corrected. So it will use that inflated amount when it comes to knowing, determining whether that $200,000 threshold has been exceeded or not. <clears throat> Um, when it comes to improvements, um, again, we made some improvements when it comes to the REST API um, regarding the primary email and then the building IRN. So just, again, some um, couple items dealing with that um, ESS connection. <clears throat> Next was a field, again, relating to um, employee self-service. Um, that need to be, to be put in place when it comes to using the timesheet um, part of ESS. Um, so that is adding that the new timesheet required field 
to the position record. So if I switch over here, see that timed out. And I go to the position record, the field that was added is this field here, and it's called timesheet required. So in order for um, timesheets to automatically be um, populated when it comes to ESS, um, this flag here, this checkbox will need to be marked on the payroll side. So that's what's determining um, on the ESS side whether to automatically um, populate a timesheet for those individuals that um, <clears throat> require a timesheet and you know if the district is, is going to use that part of um, ESS. So the um, this flag can be mass loaded. So you know districts can utilize the mass load option um, to update this field. Um, I've included the, the column heading um, that needs to be <clears throat> included in the load um, file itself. And then the values are just true, true or false, just like, I mean, obviously you're probably not loading false, but um, those are the values that the, the system will accept. Also in our mass load chapter, um, you can see that the fields um, that are the columns that are required are employee dot number, the position number. Um, we're not probably going to be adding a new position, so this retirement code um, column heading um, can be left off of your load file. So we just need the employee number, the position number, which is the number column heading. And then over here, you can see that new um, timesheet required column heading and then the values that are um, applicable to that column heading. So I do have um, just a real easy example here um, in bring this spreadsheet over. So you can see here that I have for this employee, um, I have that employee number um, column, I have the number, which is the position number, and then I want to update this employee's timesheet required um, checkbox to be marked. So it's gonna you know, populate that timesheet for this employee um, when it comes to employee self-service. So I'm gonna save this as a CSV file. So just like all other um, mass load, load files, they do have to be saved in CSV format. And then I'm gonna go to utilities and I'm gonna go to mass load. I'm gonna browse to find my file. You can see I spelled sample wrong there, no big deal. I'm gonna select the importable entity of, of position and I'm gonna click load. So you can see here, we've kind of updated um, this a, a bit ago so that it um, is, this nice grid um, is on <clears throat> the uh, mass load screen. So it tells you how many records were loaded and then how many errors were encountered. So fortunately, we, we didn't have any errors. And I'm gonna look at that employee. I guess I should have showed you what it looked like before, but you'll have to trust me that it didn't, it wasn't checked. Um, and if I go to this employee's um, position one, because that's the the um, employee and that their position that we um, updated, you can see now that that timesheet required checkbox is marked, okay? So for those of you, um, you know, your districts that do wanna utilize um, this timesheet feature, you know, obviously using the mass load option is gonna be super beneficial. Um, you can also, add this under the more option to your grid. So if you scroll down, it's under the, the pay group um, uh, option here, you can see this timesheet required um, column can be added to your grid so you can filter it, you know, make it useful uh, in any way that might be helpful. Okay, all right. Make sure there's no questions. Okay, um, moving right along then, we had um, 
We've also made updates, again, relating to ESS to actually turn off those um, classic payslip archives. Um, this will prevent the, ne the necessity for dual licenses. Um, so in classic, social security numbers were used as employee numbers. So there is a chance that old payments could include those social security numbers. So if you turn this, you utilize this option and turn those um, payslip archives off, then, you know, there's no longer any need for, you know, security, that extra layer of security, um, because those won't come into play at all. Um, so we had to make some changes on the payroll side in order for ESS to um, be able to utilize um, or have that functionality. So there is a configuration option um, in, on the ESS side under system, and it's called payslip configuration. Um, and in, in the documentation on the ESS side, um, you can see here um, that that's been documented. So um, if you wanna you know, not bring those um, into play on the ESS side, you just check the box um, or uncheck the box accordingly um, as to how you want those to appear or not to appear. All right. Um, again, we've uh, made another change to mass load. Um, and again, sort of along the, the, the ES, ESS um, um, functionality, um, we've, we did suggest, um, you know, when districts migrated from classic to the redesign um, for those that are still, we're still using social security numbers um, as their employee numbers or employee IDs, um, that those be um, switched to something else. Um, you know, obviously for security reasons, we're, we wanna move away from using um, those numbers in any way we can. Um, unfortunately, some um, are still using social security numbers as their employee numbers. So again, um, we didn't, we don't have a way to mass change those. Um, so they have to be mass loaded. So this change was put in place to allow those numbers to be changed using mass load. Um, again, in the documentation um, under the employee, let me go back up here, sorry to scroll. We have the column headings that are required. So um, the ID is required when we're updating. Um, so when we, when we refer to the ID, that's that long database ID. Um, so I'll show you here in a second where to find that and what it looks like. Um, we won't be leaving it blank because we're gonna be updating those employee IDs. Um, so again, the ID refers to the database ID and then the number um, refers to that new employee ID or number that we want um, to be changed and not use the social security number any longer. Um, the last name and first name, um, I you know in the spreadsheet in the example um, I have, I'll show you. It's probably helpful to include that in your um, file originally so that you know maybe who, you know, you're not gonna be able to identify an employee by their database ID and maybe, you know, obviously not probably by their social security number. So it's probably, you know, helpful to include those two columns in your original um, spreadsheet. But then when you go to load the file, I always suggest anything that you're not wanting to update, remove that you know, from the file altogether. So there's no chance of, you know, something obscure happening and, and information get, you know, that gets changed um, inadvertently. So um, I do have a, a file here that we can step through together. And you can see here that my, I'm going to back up here. I'm going to show you what it looks like before. I didn't do that in the last load file, and it's probably 
Okay, so we're gonna use this employee as an example. And you can see here that her number, you know, let's pretend this is a valid social security number. And we're gonna, you know, update that to make it, um, you know, part of her last name and then a, a, a number. So this ID here is what we were talking about. That's the database ID. So if I go back to core and employee, you can see here the very first, if I go to more, that very first um, option here is what needs to be um, included in your load file. So that ID column, that needs to be checked or included. And you can see here that it's the database ID. Okay, that kind of identifies all the employees within the system. That's what you know the system is using um, to to know who to make the change to. Okay, so let's bounce back here to our. So again, I've updated this number or the employee ID or the the number to be you know part of their name, last name, and and a, a series of numbers. Um, here's where I was saying you probably would want to include the, the employee name um, just so you know who you're working with. But I'm actually going to delete these two columns um, and not include that in my load file. Um, so I'm, I have just the number, which is, you know, what we know as the employee ID um, and then the database ID. So I'm going to save this again in CSV format. I guess I already had it saved, whoops. And now oh, I'm gonna go again back to mass load under utilities and my, I'm gonna browse to find my load file. And then the importable entity this time, we're gonna make the update to the employee record on um, that fields in, included on the employee screen. And I'm gonna click load. <clears throat> again, you can see there were one record that was loaded and there were no errors. So if there were any errors, they display below. And then it would also give us that um, load error file um, that you can open up, make any changes to and, and work with going forward. So I just wanna go back to this employee that we changed just so you can see then that you know, this employee's ID was changed to that new series of numbers. Okay, so that's how districts are going to have to move away from using Social Security numbers as their employee ID or number um, and get those changed. Um, you know, they are going to want to get those changed if they're using the employee self-service. Um, you know, again, we encourage those to be changed a while ago. So please... Um, you know, encourage your districts to to get those changed, you know, now, if they already have or not. All right, making sure there's no questions. Um, that's using the um, mass load option to change employee numbers. Um, next was a warning that we added um, to the payroll air report um, to tell users that an employee is being paid and they have no Medicare being withheld or an employee is being paid. They have a social security um, payroll item that exists and no amount is being withheld um, from that payroll item either. So here I've listed the actual um, warnings. Um, I have an example here to show you then um, of what it looks like when it comes to the the Medicare tax error um, and how that's going to look on the report, on the error report. And I do think that this has been helpful. I know we've gotten questions on, hey, um, you know, this new error um, came into play for a district. How do we correct, you know, the miswithholding? So hopefully, you know, this is going to eliminate you know, if, if districts are using their air reports like they should, um, this is going to catch that, um, you know, from not being withheld before it's too late and they have to do some additional corrections. All right. 
Um, next then, again, um, this sort of goes back to using ESS um, uh, release <clears throat> um, down here, a new feature that we had is adding this um, codes, I'm sorry, adding the building IRN column or option to the codes screen. Um, so that went out. Um, so districts, if they're wanting to filter um, or, and they plan to use their building codes um, and their IRNs to do any kind of filtering when it comes to ESS, um, we did you know, advise districts that those building IRNs needed to be updated. Um, and what happened was um, we kind of overlooked the fact that multiple codes could be using the same IRN. Um, so that caused an error, which is what um, this uh, improvement above deals with. Um, so we took that one step further on a, a next, you know, up the release after that and we removed that restriction. So districts are now able to enter um, multiple um, codes and have the same IRN. So these two kind of go hand in hand. Um, next, we um, it was we were made aware that a drop down option um, when it comes to the paraprofessional was not totally accurate. So that non-applicable option actually was displaying the 415, I'm sorry, the 414 or the, and the 505 um, uh, position code. And it really just applies to the 415. So per the EMIS manual. So now if we go to that, back to that position record, I'll just pick this employee and we go to the paraprofessional drop down um, the drop down now for non-applicable does say it's not valid for position code 415 which is the only um, position code that it does not apply to okay so that drop down was um, updated so it, it is now valid all right um when it comes to the new features, I'll skip past the first one because we've already talked about that um, and those building IRNs. Um, the next was the adding the originator type um, to allow um, the system to accept an option of two um, values are actually a space, a one, a two, or a nine. Um, and this will print in column 14. So. We had a um, situation where a district was um, switching banks and this bank needed this value to be um, option two um, when their ACH file was created. So we um, updated things on our side so that that ACH file could be accepted by um, this particular bank. So moving forward, if other banks um, need, you know, the option of two to be printed in COM 14, um, it was added to those valid values. Then lastly, um, was another um, option that was added to mass load, and that's the ability to mass load payees. So really when it comes to adding uh, or mass loading a payee, um, whether you're updating or you're adding a payee, just keep in mind that the ID is always required. So we're going to leave that blank. If there's, if we're um, adding a new payee, um, if we're updating a payee, then this pay this ID column, you know, will actually have a value um, entered. So again, if I go back to our mass load chapter and I click on payee, you can see here that the ID column is required. And again, just reiterating that it's always required when you're updating and we're gonna leave it blank if we're creating a new payee. And then these are all the various fields then um, that we can include in our load file. 
and have that um, loaded into those um, payee fields. So I do have one example of that as well to show you. And in this case, we're going to just load a new payee. So I've created um, a, a load file here, and I'm going to um, whoops, leave my ID column um, blank because uh, this is a new um, payee. And my name is going to be test payee. I'm going to you know, say, yes, this is an electronic payee. And then I have my um, street address, my city, my state, and my zip code. Yeah, I'm dreaming. I'm gonna, I wanna be somewhere tropical, right? <laughs> okay. So we're gonna save this again as a CSV file. And my um, you know, name is gonna be test payee. So that's what we're gonna be looking for. So if I go to utilities and I go to mass load and I browse to find my, my uh, CSV load file, I'm now gonna select the option of payee and I'm gonna click load. Again, I have one record here um, that was added and I have zero errors, so that's good. And now we're gonna go to core and payee and I'm just gonna look for the name test. And that's our the payee that we added. You can open that, we're gonna open that up and you can see the electronic payment checkbox was marked. My 123 Palm Tree Street was added, Island City, my state and my zip code. And again, just to point out, you know, if I was updating and I needed to include that ID in my load file. If I go to more, it's this database ID and it's that first um, checkbox here. Okay. All right. Are there any questions about anything when it comes to um, the payroll items that we covered? Okay, I don't see any. If there are, please feel free to you know, pop them in the chat and, and I'll be happy to answer them. Seeing none, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna turn this back over to Pat and she will be covering the inventory side of things. Okay, you should be seeing the, the inventory release. We had two regular releases for inventory. Um, which included fixing a few bugs. For example, reports showing items that have been disposed of in a future fiscal year. This is important because an asset that is active during fiscal year 23, for example, you would wanna show this item on your fiscal year 23 reports, even if it was disposed of in fiscal, in the future, like fiscal year 24. So now the fiscal or the fixed asset by function or class and the fixed asset by source, as well as the closing reports will all include the future year items that were disposed of. And this is based on the fiscal year that the application is currently in. So it will include the item and be shown on the fiscal year 23 reports, even though it was disposed of in fiscal year 24. And then some other reports, like the book value report, there was a, this added to the reports parameters. So if you want to include future disposed items, you would have to check that. This is on the book value report, the asset listing, and the brief asset report. So that's been added with the tool tip. The, uh, the book value report is based on when you have that checked. Um, 
the future disposed of items are determined and included on the report by the selected fiscal year. Also, if you have statuses chosen and this checked marked, then it's gonna ignore the status parameters and still include the future disposed of items on the report. So the book value, <clears throat> the disposed of items are determined by the fiscal year chosen. The brief asset and the asset listing report is based on if that you would check that, but it's also determined by the um, acquisition stop date. So once this box is checked marked, you would also have to select an acquisition and date. And if there is no stop date selected, then the future fiscal year disposed of items will, will not um, be included on the report. So you would have to have a stop acquisition date here, as well as that check mark, sorry, check marked for it to include. And that's for the asset listing and the brief asset listing report. <clears throat> and then the fiscal year report bundle will include the future fiscal year disposed of items for all reports. So that's been um, updated as well. Also corrected was the depreciation calculation. And it was previously, it was using the item's original cost at the time when it was calculating it. Now it will, it's been corrected to use the total acquisition amount for the fiscal year that's being generated you know, in the calculation. And then the cap capitalization criteria was updated to set the beginning balance amount for those items that will be capitalized. But this is specific to the items that were added in a prior fiscal year, um, rather than the year, or added in the prior fiscal year, the year that the capitalization criteria is being generated for. And another thing that was corrected was the date range on the asset listing report. So previously, oops, sorry. Oh goodness. Previously, if you entered a date, it would only include 5.2 to 5.30. So that's been corrected to include the 5.1 through 5.31 in the report. So it's been corrected to include the entire range, including the beginning and end dates of that range. Any questions on that? And then the fixed asset report was corrected by, to include items, sorry, there we go. to include items with a null or a blank acquisition method. So that's been corrected too. Other than that, there was a, a patch that was created for one specific district. And that is the May uh, recap of the releases for inventory. Any questions on that? Hey, I see no questions. So I will stop sharing.
Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, um, what I wanted to do was just talk about the employee self-service um, and not just, um, you know, what's been taking place regarding early access, but also the email that I sent out the other day regarding um, the uh, kiosk data extracts. Um, and because we made an announcement that those are available for testing uh, imports. So before we get started on that, though, um, we did include like the early access releases out here for you. And um, before I do that, let me make sure I've got chat window going here. Okay. Um, so we did have our, our early access release started in May. And um, I did not include a recap of these because uh, we'd be here all morning <laughs> if I did. Um, I think for the month of May, we did like 70 plus issues we completed. Um, and because, you know, you guys are just getting started on this because the specs haven't been available until now, um, you know, you're not, you're going to see it as it is right now. And what, you know, what, instead of what took place, you know, this last month. Um, so if you want to see more information about each of these, you can um, by just clicking on the version link. But the one thing I did want to know about the early access um, is that we did include the minimum version for payroll and workflow that needs to be in place in order for um, that ESS release. And this is just due to it being an early access uh, release right now. Once we're in production release in July, um, the plus signs will obviously be removed at that point. But um, that's kind of why they noted that because, you know, those do work, obviously work together, payroll workflows and ESS. And um, during the early access, they wanted to make note of that, that you at least have to have this USPS version, which isn't an issue because, you know, we know everyone's using the most recent version and the workflows version too, to make sure that you have the um, minimum version when you're running the ESS and early access. Um, so uh, with that then, um, what I did talk about is that email that I sent out um, a couple of days ago regarding the extracts. And um, in there we noted, um, I have a copy of that, I probably do, there it is. Um, we did note that, you know, the extracts, the kiosk developers um, have been working really hard on getting these extracts out here. Um, the only thing that we have come across so far with the actual data in the extracts is that it's a little old. Um, and I know that they are working on that in order to get them to increase those extract dates more frequently so that basically the extract date um, is within the day or uh, the within a day or the actual created date. So right now, if you're extracting information out of there, um, you're doing a test import, it's probably back from the middle of um, And so obviously, if you're trying to do any type of balancing with what's currently in kiosk, it's not going to balance because um, the data that's being imported in at this point is older. Um, but um, obviously, we are um, working with the developers um, in the, in Kiosk, and um, we actually are going to be meeting with them tomorrow again, and we're going to see um, the progress that they made in order to get those extracts very close to the created date um, so that it's almost the same information. Um, so I wanted to, you know, let you guys know about that, but, you know, we feel it, you know, we wanted to get something out there because I know many of you wanted to do some test imports just to see, are, do we have any errors? Are the imports working okay? Um, and so, you know, we definitely wanted to get that out there. So you guys have that, but obviously before production, um, this part here, you know, regarding the frequency and that the data reflects real close to the created date, we've got to get that uh, confirmed with the developers um, so that when it comes to production time, all of that is uh, working correctly. Um, so with that, I did want to talk about um, 
the support resources we have out there when it comes to your ESS conversions. And um, what we did is, and we listed those all in that email for you, is we do have like a conversion guideline um, that just kind of gives you reminders and recommendations regarding some pre-conversion steps um, that should be taken in kiosk and in USPS. And Lori talked about some of those uh, when she was talking about some of the updates that were made in USPS. And so I wanted to kind of go through um, the guideline, um, not so much the installation guide, um, but uh, actually the extracting data out of kiosk and that import document. Now, Matt went through, Matt and Mark went through the installation guide information and the import from kiosk in that conversion demo that we did a few weeks ago. Um, so that demo is out there and available for you guys to review. Um, but I just kind of wanted to focus a little bit more on this conversion guideline that we wrote, as well as the extract um, guideline that we wrote just a few days ago to help you with finding the extracts in kiosk and how to import them in. Um, so let me just talk about those here in a little bit. Get to it. Okay, so um, in the uh, homepage, uh, we do have our employee self-service documentation and we have the user manual, which is where the guideline and the export or the extracting kiosk data, it's where those are at. We placed them under the appendix, similar to how we did that with the other software applications. So um, when you go down to the appendix, you're going to see the conversion guideline document, and you're going to see that extracting data out of kiosk document. So we provided the links in the email that take you directly there, but in case you wanted to know where are they at anyways, um, they're under the appendix. And then obviously we have the installation guide here on the main uh, ESS documentation page, and we have the import um, so you're importing those kiosk extracts. We have the steps and how to import them into ESS here. And so um, I'm gonna go into the conversion guidelines first, and just talk about that. And so what we've put in here is the actual conversion timeline. Again, just to remind you of where we're currently at with the conversion um, by September 30th, the existing kiosk will reach its end of life. Um, except for Ippy Dippy. So um, the ability to go in and post and do processing in kiosk will cease at that point. And then underneath, um, we have like a legacy kiosk area. And in here, we just talk about recommendations, um, you know, creating some kind of deadline date with your districts on when they should stop entering information into the legacy kiosk. Um, and so, like I said, you know, we are working with getting those extracts to be created more frequently with the most current information in order for you guys to be able to, um, you know, schedule these type of deadline dates with your districts. So um, one thing, too, that we recommend is that any, so you can kind of look through the first couple bullets there. It kind of talks about that. Uh, this bullet here, though is making sure that any outstanding leave must be fully approved in the kiosk application. Um, we aren't moving archived leave. Uh, the leave uh, requests are not going to be in ESS. They will be on your kiosk extracts that the districts can then archive. Um, we have, um, I've pulled up a couple of those. We've kind of looked at them, we can see the actual leave request. It's in a spreadsheet format, but you can see the details. So if for some reason, somebody needs to know what they had from two years ago on a certain leave request, you can do a search on this spreadsheet for that. Um, so those will be included in those um, in the archive data. And we'll talk about where those are at here in a little bit. But you do want to make sure that outstanding leave requests are fully approved, meaning it goes through the complete workflow in kiosk and is fully approved, not in progress. It needs to be fully approved. Um, and so, um, so I just kind of have a de definition of what that outstanding leave request uh, means in here. 
So like we said, kiosks is going to remain available um, until September 30th for those districts wanting to, um, for those districts wanting to extract outstanding approved leave requests out of kiosk in order to post them into USPS. So the kiosk leave manager and the kiosk leave export administrator may continue using that export approved district request option in kiosk up until September 30th to extract and then import approved absences into the appropriate payroll in the USPS. And the thing I think I want to make note of that is future um, kiosk requests that have been fully approved. Let's say you make a date to say, we want you guys to stop processing in kiosk on July 15th. Um, but there probably are fully approved leave requests out there for October, um, you know, just future ones. Um, and so those are still sitting out there. And even though, um, so what we want to make note of is that anything up through that, you know, time frame, you could go in still in kiosk up until the September 30th and pull those out in order to post them into USPS. So um, when it comes to any leave requests with a date like after September 30th, um, then uh, those type of things, you can still extract that data out and leave that uh, spreadsheet out there and pull those ones when you need to and post them into USPS. Um, so that is an option there. Um, and we, we kind of explain all of that here in this bullet. Um, so when it comes to, but you know, the other option that you have is um, for those users that enter their leave, you know, that you, you don't want to kind of keep track of that spreadsheet, you have to remember to post stuff, and you've got, you know, some leave requests that they need to put in after September 30th, then um, those users can then enter their leave requests in ESS instead. So they're basically re-entering them at that point. Um, so, you know, there's there's options here. So I think it's just a good idea to go in and review these bullets and decide, you know, with your districts, what are they, you know, going to do in regards to that? But, you know, we wanted to provide kind of some recommendations on there so you guys have, you know, a place to start. And then you can go from there as to what uh, the, the guidelines that you want to present to your districts. Um, just some other things in here as well. Um, if you have workflows that are not being used in kiosk, um, you can clean them up um, prior to conversion, or you can wait until after the conversion and clean them up in ESS. So it's not something that has to be done. But, you know, if you're taking a look at a district's kiosk data and some of those workflows have never been used, and should we go ahead and just get that stuff cleaned up? So when they get extracted out, um, they're not included in the import into ESS. So that's totally up to um, you and the districts and how you guys want to do that. But it can, can be cleaned up afterwards. Um, <laughs> we also strongly recommend that you guys work with your districts on a plan to store those legacy kiosk extracts for archival purposes. So like I said, those leave requests that aren't going to be coming over in ESS, but you wanna store them somewhere so that in case they ever do need to go in and look at those old leave requests, they have the way to do that. So like I said, we'll talk about what's in those extracts here in a little bit. Um, the historical leave requests in kiosk, like I said, I think I said this three times now, are not going to be imported into ESS. So this is just, again, another reminder <laughs> that um, they um, will be on that extract file. So, um, and then we kind of have a little section here on um, employee self-service and some of the things that we recommend be done in USPS uh, prior to doing the actual extracting out, or I'm sorry, the importing of the KS extracts into ESS. And we touched upon these uh, during the USPS portion of this about the building codes 
and about those districts that um, did not convert um, their social security numbers to MPIDs back in classic. And if they still need to do that, they need to do that now because we do not want those social security numbers to be coming over into ESS. So, and she provided that information to you. And she also has a link here um, that um, has a page talking about those uh, numbers and updating the SSN to the MPID uh, with the um, spreadsheet, uh, the template spreadsheet. So all of that's provided here. Also, um, this next step just talks about the installation guide, and it's walking the locally hosted ITCs through the steps of creating that application instance. Um, for those hosting with the Management Council, uh, Chad, I talked to Chad about that this morning, and he is rolling out a document in the, and have it in the wiki as well about what needs to be done for those districts that host with the Management Council. He'll provide the steps in VRA of what you need to do to create those empty ESS instances um, so that you can import that. So um, when I talked to him this morning, he goes, I'm gonna get that out there next week for them. So, um, and obviously he'll make a, an announcement, send an email to you guys to let you know. Uh, but for those that don't host with the Management Council and are doing it locally, the Employee Self-Service Installation Guide should help you out with that. Um, so once that um, installation is complete and they've got um, an actual empty instance out there, that's where you want to get started on extracting their data out of kiosk. Um, so for those districts, um, obviously, that have data that needs to be extracted out of kiosk in order to archive it or if they want to, you know, and or they want to import some of that into ESS, we have this extracting data out of kiosk document. And this is the one we just created um, recently. Um, and so I wanted to go over this with you as well, um, just to get you a little more comfortable in what you're doing in kiosk in order to get the data. So um, obviously, ITCs should be doing this. Um, and not the districts uh, because of um, um, it'll just make it easier in order for you guys to know exactly which ones, which CSV files need to be extracted out. Um, you'll be, you know, unzipping zipped files and stuff like that. So we just felt it would be best for the ITCs to manage this. Um, and so the extracts are not found in their live production instances of kiosks. I think um, the concern was the performance and if storing all of that would cause issues um, with, the, with kiosk possibly going down um, and stuff like that. So they storing the extracts in the test application only. And I have the link here to the kiosk te test application. So that's where your district's extracts are going to be. And so you will need to log in to this test instance. And when you log in, you are going to use the same login credentials you use now in the live application. So it's not like you need an, a different username and password to log in here. You're going to use the same ones. Now, what I've been seeing is that most ITC staff have a have a ITC kiosk administrator role assigned to their account. And that's a good thing. And I'm glad you do because it makes it so much easier when you roll when you log in with that role because you can easily see your districts um, that you you know have. And then you can click on each of those IRNs in order to get to their data extracts. So I kind of want to talk about that here. Um, and I think I have kind of an example. If I logged in as with a kiosk administrator role, um, what happens then is once I click on that district, um, like I said, once you know you log in as a kiosk administrator, let me go back here, um, you're going to click on the ITC kiosk administrator option down here. And then from there, you're gonna go to update um, slash delete district configuration. Basically that's where you're accessing your districts. And then from there, it's going to show you all of your districts. Um, and um, 
obviously, I would assume that you're just going to be worrying about the active ones um, and not the inactive uh, statuses. And then from there, you are going to click on that IRN, and then that will take you to that district's configuration page in kiosk, which is kind of where I'm at now. Um, and at the very top, you are going to see the export files. And you're going to really have to take a good look at the file names and the created date, because you can see there are several different versions. Um, the developers, the kiosk developers are aware of this. They're going to eventually purge off the old versions um, because this newest version should be everything up till, like I said, right now, they're working on that. But right now, it's it, the data in there is probably the middle of May. So they're working on this. So like I said, that it gets within uh, the day of the created date. But what happens is um, you're going to take a look at these and you're going to say, OK, I've got on June 7th, which are my three files. These are the three files I'm concerned about, right? Because all these other ones are old versions. So with these three files that were created on the 7th, I have a no USPS, I have an Ippy Dippy, and I have an in USPS. And obviously, the date here coincides with the date here. So they just put the date on the actual zip file as well. These are zipped files. These are folders in there that contain a bunch of spreadsheets within each one of those. In order to download these, you need to click on the file link. So you're going to be downloading each of these zipped files or folders um, somewhere you know, on your, um, uh, your PC. So you're going to go ahead and download each of these, and then you're going to unzip them. And when you do then is when you're going to be able to see all of the information within each one. And so I'm going to take you back to that guide, because what I did is we put in like a um, an actual like images, uh, kind of what you're going to see in some of these. So um, and this just kind of, you know, explains Again, what we just went through, when you're ready to go in and download that, um, the, the most important one that you're concerned about at this time is the no USPS one. If you are going to extract those files in there to import into ESS. So if you're wanting the workflows, the users, um, all of that information from Kiosk, so that doesn't have to be recreated in ESS, all of those files are going to be in this no USPS zipped file. So you're going to download and unzip the most recent version of that. And the rest of those Kiosk extracts can be archived at any time. They aren't going to be used like the no USPS one is. So for our example, we're concerned about this no USPS one, but the Ippy Dippy, if they're still using Ippy Dippy until you know July of next year, that one isn't of concern at this point because it's not going to continue, you know, it's going to be changing. The in USPS is, you know, all the other archived information. At that point, you know, when they're done processing, in kiosk um, with that date and you have that cutoff date and they can't process anymore, then maybe that's a good time then to archive this file as well. Um, but you know, you can do that anytime up through September 30th to get that information. Um, so the pressing one at this point is that no USPS one. And so um, and so like I said, we have these um, listed here. And I think another good thing is when you see like the extracts, the most recent extracts, kind of good to know at this point, what does that all include? And kiosk, the functionality, whatever they have checked, is basically the information that's going to be included in those extracts. So I think this is good to know. Is this a district that just uses W-2s and pay slips? Or is this a district that does use the leave information? Uh, because that could determine how you're going to import, right? Um, if you have a district that does not use leave requests, 
when you go in to do the import um, into ESS, you're going to skip those steps because they don't use leave request. All you're concerned about is importing pay slips and W-2s. Um, so, you know, it's kind of just good to see that information. So again, if I go back to a real instance, you can see down here, what all did they use? Um, and those, that's the information that's going to be pulled into the extract. And then what we did is down here at the bottom, we kind of explained without getting too deep into the weeds, uh, because, you know, trying to figure out what the kiosk developers and how they're going about doing this. Um, but um, we explained the possible files, zipped files that can be included in the extract. Um, Rhonda, yes, you just use the most recent no USPS file. Correct. So um, in here, if they have several here, you're not looking at each one of these. You're concerned about the most recent. That is absolutely correct. All right, so kind of going down into here, um, like I said, there could be up to six extract files. It depends. Did they use Ippy Dippy? Did they use timesheets? Um, you're probably all going, they're all going to have a no USPS and an in USPS for sure. Um, if they use timesheets at some point, even if maybe they're not actively using them now, um, that will be created. And so that's the first one here. And obviously it's nice the way that they, you know, marked these TS stands for timesheets. So you know that that's your timesheet one. So at this point, um, the timesheet setup um, is not available to import into kiosk. So it's, we don't have timesheets ready until July, um, but you know, we just wanted to let you know where that information is at. Um, this next one, like I said, is the one that you're concerned about the most. And we did bold that in here to say, these are the files, some of these files, not all of them, obviously. Some of these files in here are the ones that you're gonna need to import into ESS. And we just marked some of them. I believe we have a few more extracts that we still need to update in our employee self-service import from kiosk manual. <laughs> um, so I probably don't have all of them um, highlighted here, but I did include some of them. Um, and in here, some of them are intuitive, some of them maybe not so much, but I think you know, most of them are. Um, like um, the uh, kiosk leave approval um, workflow. So that would be the, the groups and I believe the, that probably is the group chains. Um, if they had URLs, you know, in there, those can be um, extracted and imported in, the actual kiosk users. And so all of these are going to be listed in our, excuse me, employee self-service import for, from kiosk. Um, and I'll talk about that when we get in there in a little bit. So you're basically going to download and unzip this uh, folder in order to see all of these. Um, and then at point then, you're going to go in and um, you're going to pull this in into ESS using our kiosk load option. And I'll get to that, like I said, in a little bit. Um, the Ippy Dippy is another zip file. And if they use Ippy Dippy, then it's going to create an Ippy Dippy extract. Um, so this is create, this contains any Ippy Dippy related information. But I think the biggest thing with this is that they're they're going to be if they're using Ippy Dippy and they're going to continue using Ippy Dippy uh, up through next July. Uh, archiving this right now, probably you know at this point um, you probably want to hold off, or if you do, you're going to have to update it uh, because um, it's generating where it is currently. So just something to keep in mind. That's why we put a note here on that. Um, and then we have an in USPS, and this contains other kiosk related data that is not included in the no USPS. So we should not have duplicate files here. The no PS has a set of extracts, and then the NP in USPS has the rest of the set of extracts when it comes to the kiosk related data. Um, and so in here, what I just wanted to make note is that 
these extracts do include the kiosk leave requests. Now, I can't tell you in there, the, I see a several different type of a leave request spreadsheets, but um, I think that, you know, they're all kind of broken up a little bit. I, I haven't had a chance to really look to see, is there one of these CSV files that contains every leave request or are they separated out by uh, exported versus fully approved versus in progress? I don't know yet. Um, so, um, but they're all in here. So um, they're, so I just kind of, you know, took a little screenshot of some of that. I think this was all the information on this uh, test district that I extracted out. But anything obviously with leave request, those are the ones that contains the leave request information. Um, so it is, you know, strongly recommended that this gets archived in case ever need to go back and look at those leave requests from kiosk. Now, the last two here um, are will only be generated if in kiosk um, they the data contained um, attachments of some reason uh, for some reason. So this kiosk files will be generated if they have um, kiosk information that had an actual attachment to it. Same thing with Ippy Dippy. If they had attachments on any of the Ippy Dippy related information, then those will be stored, those attachments on a separate file. So if they didn't use attachments at all and never attached anything to you know, a leave request or to an Ippy Dippy, um, then uh, these won't appear as uh, extract that you can archive. Um, but those are the six, possible six extract files that will be listed in their kiosk experts. So I hope that helps just to kind of go through that a little bit and kind of see, okay, um, what's all in here and what, what do each of these mean? Um, so that kind of gives you some guidelines there. And so going back to um, our steps here, and I'm just going to back up to get back to the conversion. And then, you know, once you get those extracts out there and you're ready, you got your empty instance in there and you're ready to import those, the data from the kiosk extracts into ESS, then you're going to refer to this employee self-service import from kiosk. And, um, it is you know, important to note that um, these need to be done in the order that they appear. And um, in here, we did make a note as well that if your district didn't use leave request and kiosk, you don't wanna carry that stuff over, that you can skip those specific steps that are related to leave request information or leave request setup. Um, and so from there, it goes down here and goes into detail about each one of these. And like I said, we still are working on this. We still have a few more of these um, import options to put in here, but this is what we have so far. And, um, and what's nice is that everything shaded in blue is going to refer to that extract CSV file, uh, which one you need to pull in. So looking at this, we need to import um, the kiosk extract that has the IRN underscore kiosk underscore users. And we saw that um, when we were looking at the kiosk extract document, and I was showing you the one um, extract where the no USPS one, that was one of the CSV files in there. So, and this was uh, the information that Matt covered at that conversion demo a couple of weeks ago. And he basically just went through each one of these and how to import them, and then um, you know where you need to go. So with ITC access, you need admin role, and you're going to um, go into the system kiosk load option, and that's where you're gonna go in, import in, upload that kiosk user extract file, you know, select the right load option, got users, I need to pick the kiosk users, and then you're going to import that in. And when you do, it will, might give you possible errors that were generated and also show you the records that were loaded. 
which because that file is in a CSV format, you can kind of count, you know, how many rows are in that um, CSV file versus how many records were loaded in. And so um, they have noted here that an air file will be generated and any messages will be displayed on the screen once the file has been processed. And you want to verify that the total records loaded match um, the non-deleted users in the kiosk users file. So again, we're kind of giving you guys some tips on what needs to be compared back to. Um, and then you can also extract the users to a CSV file from the user's grid in order to verify that information as well. So with some of these, we have added um, error messages, um, possible error messages, messages that you could get when you import the data. Um, and uh, Mark's provided those in here. So he just kind of takes you through each one of these. And here's one where they're importing the groups. And in there, here are maybe some possible air conditions um, that, um, um, that you need to look into further. Um, so he provides some of that and what they need. Um, with the the spreadsheets as well, once you load that spreadsheet in and it you maybe you get some errors and it didn't completely everything from the extract got loaded in and it did generate some errors and it creates that CSV file um, of the ones that contain errors. If you make corrections then to those, you want to import that newly updated file. You do not want to import the original file again, or you're going to double, uh, dupl you know, are going to have duplicate information in ESS. So you just want to make sure that, okay, I imported it in. I have three with an error. Okay, I see what the problem is. I'm going to correct it on that spreadsheet that was generated from my import, fix those, and then I'm going to take that file and import that in and see if that gets rid of those three. Um, so I know we had something similar. I think payroll does that um, with their import loads. And also I remember doing that with AR as well. We import things, you just focus on that new CSV file that was generated and work on the errors from there. Um, so yes, yeah, so he goes in here and again, all of these are from those extracts. And then again, if there's some possible errors, those are provided in here. Um, so, yeah, like I said, I think we may have a couple more to add in here, but uh, this is where this document is currently at right now. So we'll get the rest of that stuff updated soon. Let me go back to the guidelines. Um, and so, yeah, so I, you know, you went in, created the instance um, using the installation procedures. And then you extracted the data out of kiosk, and then you used um, the import to import any of those extracts into ESS. Um, and then, you know, we just talk about some other steps. Um, you know, if you're not using the workflows, um, ESS is dependent on them. So that needs to be set up, obviously. And the installation guide provides that information. Um, on how to set up those workflows. So that's just kind of a reminder tip. And then same thing with the post import. <laughs> These are just some helpful tips. And Lori talked about the timesheet requirement checkbox uh, for those positions, talked about that earlier. And also um, uh, the last one is if you do need to reset passwords and possibly usernames. If they don't wanna use, I think in kiosk, it uses your email address. If they want to change that, uh, maybe they're using Active Directory and they want to change that up and um, make it first name dot last name. Um, we do have steps in the documentation on how to take care of that. Um, so we've noted that in here as well. Um, and those are the things that we've thought about so far. Obviously, um, if there is anything else while you guys are going through these test imports, you find issues. Um, and obviously, you know, we're hoping to get some of that stuff figured out um, and fixed before um, the production release. But obviously, too, the production release, we encounter errors and stuff that may be good to include on the import um, guideline or something that we need to add to this ESS conversion guideline. We will certainly do that. 
Um, but we just wanted to, you know, kind of talk through this with you guys today. I hate to send email messages and not have a way to then show you some of this. So I thought since we just sent that out Wednesday, uh, we thought today would be a good day to kind of go over this stuff with you. Um, and because it's recorded for those that couldn't be on the call today, they can listen to this later. Um, but hoping that that helps um, with the ESS conversion process for you. Um, I believe I'm looking at my email to make sure. I think that's it. And obviously, um, like I said, the conversion and the extracting stuff are located in the appendix. The actual import and installation guide, we kind of have that up in the main um, employee self-service documentation page. So we didn't put those other two documents, the conversion guideline and the importing ESS in here. We kind of felt like maybe that should just be under the user manual, under the appendix. Maybe we'll change our bytes and add it in here. But the installation guide and the import uh, into ESS, those are provided here. Okay. I know that went a lot longer today, um, but you know, we just wanted to, to give you guys that information to help you along with that. One other thing before um, we go here is I just want to talk about what's coming up. And I also want to note something in regards to um, feedback from our fiscal year and review sessions. Um, so just to look into this month, I can't believe we're in June already, but um, in June, we have uh, basically a session every Friday, I believe. So we have SGRS Advance coming up next Friday. So we're going to uh, dig deeper into the advance um, and talk about that with you guys. And then we're going to have a deeper dive into AP invoicing on the 21st and talk about all the good stuff when it comes to invoicing and USAS, um, and AP invoicing and USAS. Uh, the last Friday, we're going to do more of a deeper dive into ESS, actually. We aren't gonna talk about time uh, sheets at that time, um, but we're just gonna go in and just talk about and get you guys more familiar with the ESS application. So that'll be the last Friday in June. In July, we are planning on adding uh, a session for timesheets. Um, you know, looking at there, we have just a handful of districts that are currently actively using timesheets. So we feel like it's not pressing, especially since it's such a busy time uh, for us anyways with this clear in, to give you that session now. Um, so we're like, let's just wait maybe till the end of July and go in and do a session on timesheets with everybody. Um, that gives us an opportunity to, and that's supposed to be out there at the beginning of July, to go in and, you know, get the information, the documentation done and, um, you know, better familiarize ourselves with that as well. Um, so we plan on probably putting that in that last Friday of July here. Um, so whatever that be, the 26th or something. Um, so we're going to add a session there. One other thing I wanted to note, it, uh, note in regards to um, our fiscal year end sessions is, like I said, we got some great feedback. We appreciate, um, you know, you guys completing the evaluation forms for our training sessions. And many of you um, responded that you loved the split format, um, just focusing on USAS and inventory that one Friday and then payroll, you know, a separate Friday. So too much information. So it's nice to split those out into different Fridays. Um, but there were quite a few of you that said, could you bump them up maybe? Um, just so we have time to review that information so that then we can present it to our districts. And that is a little bit of a struggle for us because um, of what's being updated in the software. You know, we try to give you all of the updates, but some of those updates may not be done and ready until closer to fiscal year end or calendar year end time. Um, so um, we can bump them up probably a week, not any more than that. Um, and so we were kind of looking at calendar year end and I know we've got USPS on the 8th. And then we've got USAS on the 15th of November. We can bump them up and make USPS on the 1st. 
USAS on the 8th, and then the October recap, we can move down to the 15th. If you guys really feel strongly that you need an extra week for us to bump that stuff up. Um, otherwise, going into October doesn't make sense because um, we may not have anything to show you if those updates that focus on calendar year end aren't ready yet, right? So, um, but, you know, we can get those and bump those up another another week. So, you know, if you guys um, feel pretty strongly about that, we can definitely do that. Um, so, you know, we'll get those updated um, and we'll make those updates here. So I will be adding a session for timesheets and we will be moving these around, basically just doing a little calendar shuffle in November in regards to calendar year end. One other thing to note too, you know, if we do, you know, since if, you know, we are going to be doing these a little bit earlier, um, one thing you'll really want to pay attention to is in our calendar and review materials that that updated column, um, you know, some of those issues that are scheduled for payroll and USAS that aren't ready when we do the review with you, um, we will obviously update the information. Um, and obviously, you'll know that, too, when you see the releases come out and say, OK, we had the session with them last week, but they made an update, you know, the following week, we will make sure too that we update this. So you want to pay attention to the updated dates. So obviously, if, you know, it wasn't ready when we did the year-end review with you, uh, we will make sure that we update the checklist, um, PowerPoint or whatever uh, needs to be done, and we will mark the updated dates. So if you see dates after our session that we did with you, then you know that we made an update um, based on a recent release. So, uh, so we just wanted to, you know, kind of clarify that with you guys. But yeah, we we can bump up those sessions so that you guys have a little more time. Okay, I think that's all I had. It's ten thirty Friday, and I'm sure you guys have plenty to do. So, uh, again, thanks you guys uh, for uh, attending today's session. And I guess we'll see you guys all next week. Have a good weekend.